Welcome back to the Inside Sports Podcast. That's with the DE capitalized. My name is Joseph Bernard, and Cole Daly's not here today. We do have Jordan Cruz. Cole Daly is taking care of some important business. Um, he's studying abroad. I don't mean to release that. Not right now. Not right now. He's going to be studying abroad, and he's in a meeting for that currently. Just business as usual as Cole Daly. Always, always a businessman. Um, but the show must go on with Joey Bernard, JB, and Jordan Cruz. And we have a packed episode for you. Oh. Today, as the time of this recording, you'll you'll probably see this Friday or Saturday, probably Saturday morning. We'll see if I edit this early. Opening day. Beautiful sight to see. As you can see, both of us have our Cubs gear on. It's, it's a wonderful sight to see, Jordan Cruz. It's incredible. I was playing Jump by Van Halen on the way over here. It used to be the old WGN uh, music, I think, and that it's 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 weird how it kind of when spring training hits right you look at the next month and you're like oh my gosh it's gonna be the longest month ever but i mean here we are it 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 really crept up on us and with march madness i think that helps speed up the spring training process a little bit you're focused in on basketball then all of a sudden baseball's here so we'll get into that later but i am really freaking excited to talk about it before we get into the baseball stuff we do have some breaking news we do have to get into about the men's basketball team here at SIU. And just not 20 minutes ago, some breaking news just released from ESPN.com itself. Athletics has not even put out a statement at the time of me recording this. Um, Scott Nagy will be the new men's basketball coach at SIU. Uh, He used to be the South Dakota State head coach. Apparently when they were transitioning from a a Division II program into a Division I, uh, and he used to be the Wright uh, State head coach. Um, with that, that was his most recent job, I believe. Correct. Right, correct. Um, and, yeah, Jordan Cruz, I guess, do you just have any immediate thoughts? It's just quick information here, but immediate thoughts, I guess. Yeah, so I've heard a, a lot of rumblings from people who would know better than any three of us would about this situation. Um, I don't want to I don't want to dog the hiring or anything, but I, I definitely – know for a fact that this wasn't necessarily our first choice um but again that's not a shot at scott it's just we just couldn't get i guess who we initially wanted and i think scott is a if this is if this was your third fourth or fifth choice i think he's a good third fourth or fifth choice um like you said a guy who has experienced a crap ton of success um getting a team to the sweet 16 even um in the division two ranks and then eventually south dakota state obviously went up a level and then he made a lot of tournaments there as well so um, in Division One, so th- this guy has a ton of experience. I am shocked a little bit that they went with a guy like this, who is, I guess, I don't want to say he's old. He's fifty-seven, right? And Brian Mullins was what was he, late thirties, yeah, early forties, something there. like that. I guess it does make a little bit of sense if you just want to go complete opposite of what you had before, and you think a guy with more experience is going to be the you know the kind of guy that can get you where you want to go. Um, in the near future, and that and that's another reason why the more I think about it, the more I like this hire, is because he is a guy that could probably win now, as opposed to a guy who's a project guy. He seems like a guy that's going to want to come in here and dominate from the beginning. Coming from Wright State, a, a program that's been pretty good over the last few years, he'll probably bring a couple of guys from that team with him. So, mm, you know, absolutely. based on things that I had been hearing, um, you know, just people that I'm around on a daily basis. Again, nobody really knows too much about him, so I think we'll learn a lot in the next couple of weeks. But I like to hire, again, a guy with a lot of a lot of success. I'm excited to see what he does. I guess just my quick thoughts just in general about having somebody that wasn't a alumni of SIU, that wasn't yeah. uh, an old player of SIU, I kind of like that idea in yeah. a way. And I know a lot of the emphasis on a lot of schools is to get somebody that used to be here, uh, that's familiar with the community, but I kind of like the idea of having a new perspective and somebody who can just, well, obviously bring more talent, but bring something that isn't something that we already have had in years past, I yeah. guess, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and I know Cole Daly talked a lot about getting the Moorhead State guy. Uh, I think Moorhead State is probably a better team, was probably a better team this year than South Dakota State from just simply – Looking at seedings, I guess uh, I' not a basketball guy. Don't know too much about the players on those on those teams, but uh, just knowing that it's somebody else outside of the building, kind of I like it. Yeah, I do too. So it, 
it is going to be really, really weird looking down on that sideline next year and seeing anybody else other than Brian, other than Brian Mullins, Mullins. Yep. Um, who did take the DePaul assistant coaching job, too. We can mention that yeah. yep. while we're here. Um, kind of a, Had he done that by the time we recorded last week? Am I, like, recycling something we already talked about? I don't think he I don't think he, I don't I don't think think he, he had did. either. So. Um, and then Troy D'Amico followed him pretty yep. much immediately, which is pretty – Predictable move, I guess. Wonder but if there will be others. They're assembling an incredible staff at yeah. DePaul, by the way. They Absolutely. hired the old Ohio State coach as well, so Which, kind of a weird connection. Correct me if I'm wrong, but did Cole Daly call that Brian Mullins going to DePaul? Well, he said it as the head coach, not the assistant coach. Oh, he didn't get the head coach position. He he got no. He's there. He's their he's assistant, their assistant coach. Okay. The old Ohio State coach is the head coach at DePaul now. Oh. He used to wow. be. At, he used to be at Butler before okay. he went to Ohio State, so he's familiar with the Big East. It is going to be interesting to watch Troy D'Amico playing in the Big East against teams like UConn and Marquette and oh. next year. That'll be, that'll be interesting. Ooh, but, um, no, I mean, they're building something incredible up there. But, anyway, back to SIU. Um, looking more at Scott Nagy's background, I guess he does have an Illinois um, an Illinois base to him. He was born in Texas, but he actually went to school in Champaign growing oh, up. Wow. So this is a lot more local than I think we realize. His dad was um, an assistant coach under the great Lou Henson. Um, at the University of Illinois, coach, I believe, of the, of the old Flying Illini back in the late 80s. So, I mean, again, this is a guy who who loves this area, it seems like. Um, I heard that his wife was here with him yesterday. So mm-hmm. I think I think they're excited to be here. Um, and, yeah, let's go dogs. New things coming to men's basketball, uh, for sure, coming in the next few seasons, uh, and especially this offseason. Um, moving on to sports that are happening currently right now. Yeah. And Saluki softball is blowing the water out of everybody right now. Since the last time we talked about them, they've been 12-1. and one. Uh, They just recently lost against UT Martin on Tuesday. Uh, it ended their 16-game win streak. That was on the road. 23-5 uh, and five they sit. They're 8-0 and in the conference. Um, and, man, like, we're talking about absolute dominance in the conference if they can uh, – win this series or possibly even sweep against you and I this upcoming weekend. Yeah. Uh, the, that seems to be the team that uh, is somewhat standing a match to the Salukis, but, uh, the, I mean, it's just kind of they're blowing away with it the rest of the way. Jordan Cruz, your thoughts on the team just this past couple weeks, I guess. Yeah, well, like you said, they've been dominant, and, and they've used the same formula that they have all year was dominant pitching and score just enough runs to win the game. Now – that, that Tuesday game against UT Martin was interesting, and I got a chance to talk to uh, Mike Trude, who's a big um, – he's, he's the voice of Saluki softball for the ESPN Plus production, so he knows a lot more than I do. And um, he, he said that on that game on Tuesday, they looked like they didn't even want to be there. And that report was later corroborated through um, our guy Alec, who I've talked to a little bit. So that, that was a little concerning, and I don't mean to – I mean, we're 23-5. and five. We've only lost five total games. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to make that – the the theme because again we were on a 16 game winning streak that's ridiculous right mm. but it I, I do want to make sure that this team doesn't have something like that happen again the rest of the season because you have to take everybody seriously and especially in a conference that's as good as the as the Missouri Valley when you may not win the conference tournament like we did last year remember we won the conference tournament last year as the six six seed yeah right and we had started off really well and then we fell fell apart really. Um, toward the end of the season, but thankfully the tournament was at our place, and so you know that helped as well. But we have to be able to stack up these wins to help our RPI rating as well. And if we don't win that conference tournament, we have to bank in these wins to be able to be an at-large bid. So every single game is important, and I think Jen Sewell would be the first person to tell you that. Um, I, again, we've been asking for this all year. I'd like to see consistent, excuse me, offensive production from everybody Um, because like we said we have had a lot of sophomore slumps Jackie Liss isn't playing nearly as well as she did last year which is almost unrealistic to expect her to be just as good Mm -hmm. Um, everyone's got a year of film on her now they're pitching her a little bit differently Um, so yeah I I really want to see more consistency there I think we will get there eventually and again we haven't gotten there and we're 23 and 5 so this team's going to be fine Um, but just wanted to throw that out there for that one little concerning loss Absolutely. I, I agree. I, the thing that would just tie a bow on to me saying, like, we're going to take this conference is just more consistency from the offense. 
everybody is asking for that, of course, like you mentioned. Um, but, man, we really are just riding our pitching right now. Yeah. Maddie Groff, not only is she just an impressive freshman in general, she's an impressive player overall in all of D1 softball. Yeah. She's literally number two in all of college softball for ERA. Mm-hmm. And only number two because the number one has four total appearances that doesn't on this even season. Count. I yeah, I, I, I think there should be some sort of requirement in terms of e- yeah. ERA qualifications. That's ridiculous. So in my eyes, she's number one. Yeah. And we're also number 10 in team, team ERA in all of D1 softball. So we are absolutely riding our pitching right now. Now, that's not to say that our offense is doing terrible. It just means we haven't quite clicked where we were last year and even the year before in terms of offense, uh, offensive consistency. So once we get there unstoppable we're, yeah. we're talking about like a huge win streak going into the conference tournament here oh yeah so um yeah this team is just absolutely ridiculous in terms of their potential moving on to baseball now they started to turn a corner as well but i think that loss they so they lost tuesday night in 10 innings against ut martin right um it was a eight to seven loss they sit at 17 and eight uh for their overall record Three and zero in the conference, uh, and they have a road series coming up against Evansville this weekend. Uh, I guess I guess it's technically Thursday, Friday, Saturday instead of a normal Friday, Saturday, Sunday yep. weekend series. Mm-hmm. But man, I was at that game, and it kind of left just a bitter taste in my mouth. Yeah, I know if you look at it just on paper, ten and three in their last thirteen games since we last talked about them, just like Saluki softball, they've been very very good. This is barely the start of conference season, and you bro- blow a lead like that of four or five runs, I believe it was. Were, was, were they up seven, seven to four? Seven to four. So three, so three runs. runs. In one inning, though. In one inning, in, yeah. in the ninth inning, it, it was just – it was really gross to yeah, come out of that. It was it just was really gross. gross. Yeah. So I, I still thought there might have been a chance in that tenth inning that we could, you know, pop out a run, at least make it harder on UT Martin to tie it up, make this go to at least 11 innings because – I don't know. I would have assumed that the way our bullpen was going, they would get at least one run. But, man, that just left a bitter taste in my mouth. Jordan, what did you see? You commentated on that game. I did, yeah. It was it was a really fun time doing that until the top of the ninth inning. Um, and what we – so this is sort of the, the reverse, right? The baseball and softball team couldn't be more opposite of each other. The offense was really never going to be an issue for baseball. Lance Rhodes just figures out a way to put the perfect lineup out there by the time the middle of the season hits. Mm-hmm. And again, you have to understand, this team is 90, 95% transfers. So it's difficult to put together a lineup, um, or at least from a hitting standpoint, they're 90, 95% transfers. So it's difficult to put together a lineup um, when you haven't seen most of the guys play, right? Mm-hmm. But he's found a way to do it. That was never going to be an issue. Trey Cutchin batting leadoff to me is like chef's kiss. Crisp. Because yeah. he's six foot, he's not your typical leadoff hitter. He's a first baseman. He's 6'6", mm-hmm. 190, but there's nowhere you can pitch him to where he can't hit it. Absolutely. Inside, he can turn on it. Outside, he's 6'6", six, six, he can reach anything, right? And if you throw it too far out, you're going to walk him. So I love him being in the leadoff spot. But the rotation and bullpen was always going to be the question. And honestly, the other night, the bullpen pitched fine. Um, there were some errors made, one by Jake uh, – sorry, not Jake Hallgaier, um, Heston Gray at third, and then Matthew Valet, who entered the game – late because he it was a midweek game so they wanted to give um justin coist the start in center mm. he hadn't started all year um and it was against the ut martin team that at the time their, their record didn't look very good but i think they're better than the record says they've had some bad luck on their end but valet came in late in that game and from the very beginning the balls that were hit to him he kept bobbling them you could tell something was off and then he just drops that wide open fly ball and basically the floodgates open from there mm-hmm. that's when the bullpen started to get hit really really hard and so I didn't really blame the bullpen for that loss. It does, however, seem like the rotation has been figured out for starters. Mike Hansel, who just want to say he was one of my guys at the beginning of the year, said watch out for him. He hasn't been incredible, but he has turned into our Friday starter. Um, so I think that's a big deal. Uh, he's 3-1 three and, one, three and one right now. Love the way he's been pitching um, as the season's gone on again. He, like most of our starters, had a really rough start to the season. Mm-hmm. Al Holguin on Saturday, and then really the starting pitching MVP has been Aiden Fuller. Aiden Fuller was fit, was fantastic last weekend against Valpo. He's our Sunday guy now, and so if we split a series, having him on Sunday is awesome. Absolutely, and I think 
it's just going to take some time for a lot of these pitching woes that we've seen uh, and really some of these just random miscues by the defense happening late in games. I, I think it's just going to take some time. Um, as you mentioned, who, who is it that you said started in center field that got their first start? So Justin Coy started Justin in Coyce. center field. He looks pretty good out there, at least defensively. And then when Valet came in, because it, it was a close game, um, he, he just looked a little cold. He looked a little raw yeah. and, and things. I mean, he played like it too. So. Yeah, I think so too. So Cole Chrisman, just somebody else I wanted to shout out. He, he adds some power to this team. Uh, and I, I mentioned it previously in a couple of other podcasts, but I feel like he can just take any ball thrown to him and and take a yard. He's a short, yeah. stocky guy, uh, but he's got a lot of power yeah. in that short stockiness of him. Yeah. So I, I love him. He's probably my favorite player on this team, to be honest. So, yeah. um, And as a catcher, um, you know, adds some value defensively as well. Yep. Um, so that's it for Saluki Sports right now. Do you want to do college basketball first, or should we get into MLB? Let's just do college basketball. College basketball. It's, it's more current. It's what people okay. want to hear. Perfect. Um, we will get to baseball. Though. Okay. We will get to Absolutely. baseball. Absolutely. We'll probably spend way too much time talking about it. First weekend of the NCAA tournament is complete. Saying that out loud makes me almost emotional because we wait all season for this. Just um, the bracket. And then just like that, boom, in four days – First weekend is over. Did you know, Joey Bernard, that this was the most viewed, from a television standpoint, first weekend of all time? No, I did not of know that. That's all crazy. time, which is surprising to some people because at, like, like last year, and Cold Ailey and I talked about this a lot last year, how the teams that ended up, you know, the, all the good teams, or at least all the popular teams lost, right? And I made the argument, who freaking cares? But the people, the, the casual fan sort of does care, right? Mm-hmm. You know, that that – who is in it helps you determine if you're going to watch, right? Um, that's just basic. And if the, if all the great teams in the regular season lose, I mean, geez, like, that stinks. Because I always say people want a Cinderella run, but we don't want them to go too far in the Cinderella right. run. Um, that's just one of the weird, dark truths of, of sports fandom. But this weekend had it all. It had it all. Upsets. And it also had something I didn't like was the fact that for the fifth time – in college basketball history, all the one and two seeds made it out of the first weekend. Really? Five times in its history wow. that that's happened. Combined yeah. with all the upsets, too. I mean, Kentucky ruined our consensus yeah. bracket, too. Yes, they did. And we'll get into that in a moment. I just want to say the chalkiness is something that I did not see coming. Personally, I had, like, I only had one. One second. This is, gonna, this is bad radio. But one, two, three. Four, five. So I only had like six of the eight one seeds getting out, because or one and two seeds getting out, because I figure okay, there's going to be upsets. Right. So if you're gonna predict your bracket, you gotta have at least one or two one seed, one or two seeds. It, it happens losing. Every year, so, but it didn't happen this yeah, year. Not this year. So that was weird. But we still had a ton of upsets, um, and we had some tourney darlings, right? The I guys know. who become famous because of what they did in the NCAA tournament. Um, one of these guys was kind of reaching his fame before we got there, but there were two main stars of the first round. And what sucks is they had to play each other in the second round. Star number one, he was doing ads from his hotel room the night after his team won. It's Oakland's Jack Golke, the Mm -hmm. dude who shot eight two-pointers the entire (laughs) season. The man is a sharpshooter from three. He can shoot it from anywhere, anytime, anyplace. I don't know if he has an NBA future to him, but it was so freaking fun to watch him beat Kentucky. And that's coming from a guy who had Kentucky in the Final Four. We had him in a consensus Final Four. I don't think anybody saw that coming. I say that knowing that Kentucky was a terrible defensive team all year. And it's not really that they played terrible defensively. They only allowed, what, 77 points. Um, Kentucky just couldn't score. But Jack Golke could. He was incredible. That Oakland team um, was really fun to watch. And I really wish that they didn't have to play NC State in round two because NC State – with the big unit in DJ Burns, 6'9", 275. That's a little conservative in my opinion. Um, but he's a dog. He's a dog. He. I heard somebody say the other day that he, more than most players, probably every player in this tournament, seems like he always makes the right decision on what to do with the ball. He is the kind of guy that will back you down, but when he's backing you down, he's not only looking to score and get around his man, he's looking to facilitate, he's looking to get the ball out. Um, for the rest of his guys in NC State, looking at their roster, they're one of these teams that it's like, how are they so bad? 
in the regular season because they went in to the ACC tournament 17 and 14, and then mm. obviously went on that huge run um, to get to March Madness. So that was a pretty interesting uh, headline to watch. But no, they were so fun to see all year long, um, or excuse me, all 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 game long against Texas Tech and then against uh, Oakland in the second round. What a game that was too. Mm. Uh, that one going into overtime. The two tourney darlings overtime game, that was awesome. That was awesome. Um, any comments from you, JB, on anything I've talked about? I know I no. kind of rambled there at the beginning. I, I loved the NC State-Colorado game just in general. It's it's sad to see two likable teams just have to yes. face off against each other. We I, I see that in the NFL sometimes, of course. At, I mean, I'm sure you do in the NFL sometimes as well. Two teams that you just really like having to face off against each other, and one of them can't go on. So it's sad that Colorado can move on as their Cinderella story ends. So as, as a – would you consider yourself a – what kind of a college basketball guy are you? Just like an NCAA tournament guy, really? Pretty for the much most just part. NCAA. Did you tournament. find yourself being more intrigued this year than usual? Yeah, I, I was just about to say I really don't remember tuning into a single game last year, but th- yeah. this year I was I watched Clemson and Baylor. Yep. Um, Great game. Clemson moved on. Yep. Is that correct? Yep. I, I know I just, I watched the fi- I watched the beginning of it. I couldn't remember if I finished that. And, it, and they beat Baylor, which yeah. is which is crazy. Yeah. I, I know we had Baylor. I had Baylor in my own personal bracket going farther. Um, and then oh, who else? Uh, well, of course I tuned into the Illinois game, uh, thinking that they were going to upset my parents as usual. But <laughs> uh, you know they ended up in the Sweet Sixteen this year. So this is that's terrific for Marcus Damask, of course. But yeah, I'm pretty much just a NCAA tournament guy. Yeah, and it was great. Um, now, for we'll get into our brackets here in a moment, but there are a couple games, or at least one game in particular. Um, I'll get to my bandwagon teams in a moment. but So I had Oregon going pretty far in the tournament, and I saw their strategy against Creighton in the second half was one of the more unique things I've seen. And I think this is another reason why this tournament has been so intriguing, because of how many good teams there are. There are more good teams now in college basketball than ever, um, and Oregon was no exception to that. Oregon has an incredible point guard, Jermaine Kuznard. I don't know if you heard the story. His grandma doesn't like flying, and they're from Chicago. No. The tournament was in Memphis. His grandma's from Chicago, so she made the drive six hours to go watch him play, and they kept showing her um, a lot, so oh, that, that was a really interesting that's story. That's adorable. And he played amazing. He had 40 points. Um, in that first game against South Carolina, mm-hmm. played really well, basically carried his team along with his teammate in Folly Dante um, in the Creighton game. They were up by fourth, I think a minute left, and then Creighton hit a couple of shots, sent it to overtime. But their strategy in the second half, and I don't know if – I couldn't tell if their coach made them do this or if Oregon was just that tired because they're a team that likes to play really slow and Creighton just runs you up and down the court. Um, so Oregon, everybody was gassed, completely gassed. They were just slowly dribbling it up and waiting until like 10 seconds left in the shot clock to do anything. And it almost worked for him. It almost worked because of just how good Kuznard and and Fali Dante are. But unfortunately, um, they did end up losing it. It was just just cool. The reason I bring it up is it was just not cool, but interesting to see a team just be that tired Mm -hmm. in a game. And you can just tell like all the dudes are like – (laughs) <laughs> and Creighton yeah. still had a ton of energy, and eventually they, they really pulled away in that second overtime. Um, but, again, that was just one of the many incredible games. I can't go through all of them because um, we'd be here forever. Oh, That's yeah. how great this first round was. Now, three teams I will go through. I do want to update my bandwagon list um, and how they did. Two of those teams are gone. The first one that, that is out of the tournament, probably the most surprising, is the Auburn Tigers losing to Yale. Ruined a lot of people's brackets, I'm sure. Um, I think most of America probably had them going at least to the Sweet 16, Mm -hmm. if not beating UConn just to be different. Um, I wanted to do that, but we talked about why we didn't last week. If you want to know, go ahead and watch that episode. But Auburn did lose to Yale for all the reasons that Cole Daly and I said. Their guards shot them out of the game. We figured it was going to happen at some point. We just didn't think it was going to happen there. My next team. Go, or I, I just want to say I loved seeing all the memes about Yale fans. Uh, it was like Yale – I don't know. The memes were about Yale fans uh, celebrating the win, and it showed like a nerd college student in the library with his friends, That's and so it was funny. like a stock picture. Yeah. It was, I don't know. It was just I just thought it was funny. <laughs> yeah, that, that was pretty cool. Yale, unfortunately, did get smashed um, by San Diego State the next game. Another team I want to update everybody on uh, going, I guess, in 
Would this be chronological order? Yeah, Gonzaga. Mm. How about the Zags, man? Cool Daly. Cool Daly hated the Zags, and yet I think he had them going far in his bracket. So <laughs> doesn't make sense. But uh, the Gonzaga Bulldogs did defeat McNeese, a game that a lot of people thought they would lose. McNeese is a really, really good team with a really, really good coach, and then they pounced on Kansas uh, in that second half. A Kansas team that was hampered by a lot of injury, and you know, if they didn't have those injuries, I probably would have been a little bit more hesitant to just pick Gonzaga to go through, but mm. how about them Bulldogs? And of course, they get to face the team that I have winning it all in my bracket is Purdue, so I guess it's kind of a win-win for me there, win for my bracket, and then emotionally, I guess I get the win for Gonzaga. Um, this marks nine straight tournaments where Gonzaga has gone to at least the Sweet 16. Wow. Dumb, Which, pure dumbness. And again, think about how hard that is for most teams to do it. I mean, a team like Kentucky, I don't think they've made it out of the first weekend since it's been at least three or four tournaments. I'd have mm-hmm. to look that up. But it's it's been a long time. Um, you know, my Buckeyes, for example, at Ohio State, they've they haven't made the Sweet 16 since 2013, and we've been in the tournament probably five or six times since then. Mm-hmm. Illinois just made the, f- the Sweet 16 for the first time since 2005. Now they did get to play two little sisters of the poor teams to get there. But um, they still got there, but it, but it took them almost 20 years, I was right? trying to explain that to my parents. The teams that they faced just weren't the greatest. So just, I right. don't know if you should expect anything. Against Iowa State, yeah. I know that they have a good defense. An interesting thing about that is that a lot of Illinois people were complaining that BYU was a team that was supposed to be a five seed if you looked at the way that the committee ranked the teams. Mm-hmm. But because they don't play on Sundays because they're, they're Mormons, they had to flip them to a six seed. Do you get oh. do you get kind of the logic there? Like yeah. they were they're better than what their seed was. So they changed. They made their seed lower because they didn't want to play on Sunday. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's kind of weird how that worked That's, out. That's. But I can't believe they'd on the flip side, that means that Duquesne was probably higher than they should have been. Yeah. So really, you got to play a fourteen seed and a twelve seed. Yeah. Uh, in all reality, to get to the Sweet Sixteen, but <laughs> I won't take anything away from uh, Illinois yet. Um, because they did make the Sweet 16. They have a chance against Iowa State. You'll know what the result of that game is by the time you're watching this. That will be really fun. The number one offensive team in the country going up against the number one defensive team in the yeah. country. Very interesting matchup there. Um, and then the final bandwagon team, another team that Cole Daly hates. I hated them too. I dropped them. I should have dropped them instead of having them go to the, to the Elite Eight, the Michigan State Spartans. They were in it with North Carolina for a while. They had a couple shots rim out, and then North Carolina – Took over from there. They were hitting everything. Um, Cole Daly and I were having a little bit of a conversation about how, about how much we hate North Carolina, um, <laughs> something that he's very familiar with. So he's a Duke fan. <laughs> so yeah, um, North Carolina moves on. It's going to be a great second round of the tournament. JB, um, I guess which team in the Sweet Sixteen most surprised you? And um, you have Houston winning it all. So I, j- I just want to ask: <laughs> Did you see that Houston Texas A and M game? Yeah, I did, and I was certainly biting my nails the whole time because, I, of course, I have Houston winning it all. But, man, to, to know that they went into overtime against Texas A&M and then who did they face round one? Or was it? Longwood. Yeah, I mean, I don't – remind me, did they – I don't think they beat them terribly well in round one. It was pretty obvious. It was pretty obvious? Okay. Yeah. I couldn't remember if that was – both rounds or just the second round. But anyways, just to know that it just in the second round, they went into overtime against Texas A&M. And a lot of people, at least in the bracket leagues that I've been in, picked them uh, to go to the national championship. It makes me entirely nervous. So uh, my pick there is Houston just because they yeah. underperformed massively compared to what I thought they would do. Yeah. So. so the Houston Cougars, speaking of the Houston Cougars, their Sweet 16 matchup is against the Duke Blue Devils and Cole Daly. I really mm-hmm. wish he was here uh, to talk about this. Because I have a message for Cole Daly. The Duke Blue Devils have a really good chance, in my opinion, to go to the Final Four now. And I think Houston is a better team. But, again, what, what is the NCAA tournament about? It's about matchups. Mm-hmm. Houston lacks size. That's pretty much what Duke runs through is their size. Jared McCain, who I freaking hate, but he's been shooting the ball very, very well um, in these first couple of games. They smashed Vermont. They smashed James Madison um, in the second round. I think they have a really good shot to go to the Final Four because if they are able to beat Houston, I don't see NC State or Marquette, even though NC State did just beat them. I don't really see either of those two teams matching up well enough to beat Duke. And I hate to, so I hate to say it, 
Duke has a really good chance to go to the Final Four. So you think Duke is just going to ride their size until the Final Four? I think so. Yeah. Now Houston, their center is six foot seven. It's Juwan Roberts. He's a dog, and Duke has struggled with junkyard dog, t- you know, tough teams. So if they do lose, that will probably be why. But from a matchup standpoint, I actually do like it um, for Duke in the Sweet 16. Finally, before we get to baseball, I do want to update the Inside Sports consensus bracket, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, not going very well. Uh, we had, not at all. We got <laughs> 22 of the first 32 games right, which I think is it's like average to below average almost in amount to get. I typically think for me – a good first round is getting at least 25, 26. Like, that's what I would yeah. consider a good first round. Like, you yeah. did really well picking. Uh, but we only got 22 of them. And in the second round, we only got eight of them right, uh, <laughs> which is not great. But from a points left to be had standpoint, we still have our champion in UConn. We don't have two of our final four teams, though. We don't have yeah. Baylor. Which, wow. And Kentucky. That was all you guys picking Baylor. <laughs> and then Kentucky, which I had a part in. And we had Kentucky in the national championship. So that's not good. But we still have a long way to go. We still have six of our eight Elite Eight teams at the very least. Yeah. Um, we did do a lot of chalk there except for Bama versus Baylor. But So we still have Bama. We could get them in the Elite Eight. Um, we've got UConn versus Iowa State. Houston versus, well, that was Kentucky. And then Purdue versus Creighton. So it's not terrible. Could be a lot better. I did add up what the total points would be if it was, like, put into a bracket group. It's 380, which is not great. And in the bracket group that I'm hosting, it would be in the bottom 25%. So that's not fantastic. I believe that would be better than my own personal yes, you're, bracket. Yes, you, I looked yesterday. You have 370. So it would be oh, better than yeah. Joey Bernard. Better than Joey Bernard. But that's not really saying very much. <laughs> um, but, again, all brackets are about, I spoke to this last week, it's about getting your champion correct. That's how you win, yeah. right? Um, now, if you pick a common champion like a UConn, Houston, or a Purdue – that's when the earlier round games are more important because you got to get ahead of those other people that had the same champion. I unfortunately did not do that right. I lost pretty much everyone. I have three of my four Final Four teams in, um, but I did terrible in the first and second round. So, anyway, cannot wait for the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight. Another fantastic weekend of college basketball. Really, the f- it's really the last big weekend right before the Final Four. Mm-hmm. Um, what a season it's been. Can't wait to recap it all with Cole Daly. Hopefully he's here next week. Um, unless he has to go to Australia or something. <laughs> so, JB, let's get to the other big Ooh. thing happening this weekend. Take it away because it's MLB opening day. It is opening day. It should be a holiday. In my in my household, yeah, yeah, opening day is a holiday. I'm not going to work today. Yeah, I, I'm not going to work today. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> opening day is today. Uh Games should be starting here in less than about two hours, I think. The first game starts at about one twenty, maybe 2.20. depends um, on what time uh, zone you're in. They all got the uh, rain out. So. The, the 2.20 There's games? The three, 1.20 games? Yeah. Oh the my Mets gosh, got rained out. The Braves and Phillies got rained out. Well, golly. Orioles and Angels got rained out. I think the Orioles and Angels did. Well, I know the, the Brewers got rained out. When They're they playing play the Mets. Mets. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, anyways, besides some rain delays... Games should be starting soon in the next couple hours. Yes. Yeah. Um, barring weather, some teams will be starting their opening day tomorrow or maybe even Saturday. Okay, Orioles and Angels are playing. Just one. They are playing okay. yes. today. Okay. Amazing. So, with baseball season here upon, upon us, SIU's baseball season has already been going on, but now that it's officially the MLB season, I wanted to give my outlook on my division picks. I did this last year, and my luck was terrible. Uh, it was mainly just really bad uh, foresight into the season, but I think a lot of these are kind of foregone conclusions. I'd say I'm confident in four of six, okay. and I think a lot of people are confident in four of six. Would you mind denoting that as we go along? Like, tell us which ones Which you're ones com- I'm yeah. confident in? Yeah, absolutely. I will denote that. Um, and... I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take it away, I guess. So we're gonna talk about the AL East right now. And my pick, I'm going with the Baltimore Orioles. Now, they got the big the big name. Everyone talks about Corbin Burns, right? He's from the Brewers. Uh, it's a it's a a huge reason as to why a lot of people think that the Brewers will be down in the in the dumps of the NL Central again this year because they rode their pitching staff a lot last year and they lost their ace, Corbin Burns. 
uh, and he will be a huge part of this Orioles team that uh, last year made the jump to a 100-win team, won that division in a season where I thought the Rays were going to take it. Uh, and they're only going to get better with time because uh, at the beginning of the season, they're going to have, uh, I know Kyle Bradish is going to start on the IL, and then John Means starts on the IL, and once they come back, that rotation will be heavily solidified uh, with really three strong heads there. Um, that, combined with their young guys, Adley Rushman everybody talks about, but Ryan Mount- Mountcastle and Gunnar Henderson, those two guys are huge. And they even got, I mean, he's not a young guy, like I was mentioning, but Cedric Mullins, uh, I mean, he's starting to get up there in age, but he's still at the top of his game in terms of defense, uh, and he's a really nice bat to have in the lineup. Now, for a moment, I thought about the Yankees, but I just don't think anything – like, they're just too injury-prone, just in general. I can't trust any of their guys to last the whole season. Yeah. Like, I know – oh, I saw a stat months back where it's like the games that Giancarlo Stanton and Aaron Judge uh, and – I'm trying to think of the other names, but some of those other guys in their lineup that they were trying to play with together uh, were very, very minimal yeah. because they were so injury-prone. So I thought about the Yanks, just don't think they have any anything reliable in their lineup, um, especially in their rotation, too. They lost a lot of big names. Uh, Garrett Cole is still there, but he's going to remain on the IL for the first uh, two months of the season, month and a half, whatever. He's on the 60-day IL. Um but yeah, Orioles is my pick there. Any qualms with that, Jordan? Cruz? No qualms at all. They are built to win for a very, very long time. They've got a lot of prospects in their system that haven't even. Some of them haven't even gotten a AAA, but there are a mm-hmm. lot of guys that people are just people know that they're going to be incredible. So they're they're going to be young and they're going to be good for, like I said, a very, very long time. A team that I think in that division that needs to put up or shut up or just get out of our faces is the Blue Jays. That's yeah. a team that has been – you look at their roster and, like, there's no reason they shouldn't be, if not a division winner, a perennial playoff team. Yeah. Didn't make it last season. The year before, they get swept 2-0 in the wild card round by the Mariners. They need to, to figure it out. They need yeah. to figure it out somehow. Their pitching staff looks good on paper, but a guy like Jose Barrios really got hit around um, at points last year. I'm, I used to be a, a huge fan of his, but it something just seems off. Something's off with the Blue Jays, and, and again, like I said, they're a team that needs to be in the mix because of their roster, but they just haven't been. I'd be really upset if I was a Blue Jays fan uh, that they haven't gone much farther than just making the playoffs. Because, like, this is their time to win. Yeah, like this is the this is the first chance they've had to legitimately be a good team since Jose Bautista was there. Mm -hmm. They they've just kind of ran into the fact that the Orioles have just built this extremely good farm system the past couple seasons. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that every single year you see it uh, top 10 farm clubs on MLB.com's uh, their Instagram page the Orioles are right there yeah at, at number one mm-hmm. right at the top nobody even touches them I know recently uh, Chicago Cubs we touched them, I was about we to say, touched yeah, them. We're, we've we're been touching there. them recently but as an overall the past five seasons six seasons the Orioles have been up top there Moving on, unless there's anything else, Jordan. Cruz I just want to say shout-out to Jose Bautista for being yeah. such a good player that they delayed the start of the Cubs-Blue Jays game last season for his ceremony by, like, an hour. Oh, yeah. So, literally, the, game, the start of the game was delayed by an hour because of Jose Bautista. <laughs> so, shout-out. I mean, he was fun to watch, but, like, seriously. That like, sounds like a very passive Plan better. Plan better, Jordan Canada. Cruz. Canada. Jeez. <laughs> Moving on to the AL Central. Now, this one, um, oh, I forgot to mention, I guess, the Orioles is one I'm very, very confident in. So that's one of my four that I'm extremely confident in. The AL Central, the Twins, is my pick for there. Um, I think I'm also pretty confident in that. Now, that division just stinks, just in general. They all stink. The, all, all those teams, the White Sox, uh, you know, the freaking Royals, it's the bottom of the barrel of the American League and the bottom of the barrel of the league, I think. It, it's just kind of the Twins by default. Yeah. I think they just kind of have the most potential in their lineup, I guess. I think Correa has a bounce-back season 
uh, after starting with the Twins last last year. I really like Manuel Margot. Yeah. Um, I think he can be an X factor for them. He's good pickup. And then Bri- Byron Buxton. Everybody loves to see uh, defensive highlights. If by him. he stays healthy, yes, the Twins are a ninety win team, bar none. But the Absolutely. problem is you can't bank on that. And I've seen a lot of projections that people have made that have <laughs> Twins with a losing record but winning yeah. the division. Like that's just how terrible the AL Central yeah. is. But Buxton is the true key for them. And then again, if he can stay healthy, play center field, they're going to be a, a pretty mm-hmm. good team. Yeah. And the thing that we have to think about with them is they lost Sonny Gray. And he was their yep. ace last year. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if, if they can get by with Pablo Lopez, uh, I mean, they should be good enough, I think, just because their division really is garbage. Yeah. Do you think they could win this division with – 85 wins? Absolutely. 86. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I, I think absolutely yeah. they could. So I will see how they do without Sonny Gray. Um, Jordan Cruz, do you have any qualms with the Twins as a pick? I don't. A team I, I would like to look out for is the, D- the Detroit Tigers. Um, they do have some solid pieces. They made a couple of good signings in the offseason, um, especially in the rotation by getting Jack Flaherty uh, yeah. from the St. Louis Cardinals. I think him, him getting out of that system is probably going to help him. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> – no, I, I do like the way that the, the Twins are set up. Um, I'm looking at their opening day lineup right now, actually. Buxton is leading off and playing center. So that's a good sign um, to know that he is going to start this season fully healthy. They signed Carlos Santana as well. Mm. I do think that they are a team that, having lost Sonny Gray, will probably make a trade for a pitcher at the deadline, um, yeah. like they did for Lopez last season. Probably. So, yeah, I could definitely see that happening. Um, but, again, with the Tigers, they have a lot of young guys, Javi Baez as well. Probably, they should probably play him the least amount, but they can um, <laughs> because he's just a liability and it sucks. And yeah. <laughs> just, it does suck to see that, but they are a team that I think has a lot of potential. I think they're a team that should honestly creep toward 500, maybe even have a winning record potentially. Um, they would be, I guess, my dark horse pick to win the division, but I, I wouldn't put any real stakes on it. Yeah, nothing too confident that I, I, I feel anything about the Tigers yeah. um, this year. So that's, But I don't feel confident about really – anything about this division other than the twins winning it just because it's kind of by default that i think they'll win it. yeah so that's my pick for the al central so you're and you said you're 100 percent confident in that? i am confident okay. that the twins will win this division okay the al west is where we get into some mucky territory about who's going to win that division um, we talked extensively about the race late in the year uh, in the AL West with the Mariners, Astros, and, of course, the World Championship, Texas Rangers. Jordan Cruz is Texas I'll Rangers. i out here for a second. <laughs> um, but this division has been won by the Astros a lot recently, and the World Champion Rangers didn't even win this division last year. So nope. just because I say a team wins this division doesn't mean they're going to win the World Series, doesn't mean they're going to go farther than any other team that – you know, might also make the playoffs. You just never know in baseball, I guess. My pick, I'll say it up front, it is the Astros. It's the Astros. I have to go with the team that has been doing it for so long, pure domination, and I think position by position, and this is what kind of got me to pick the Astros, is I was going through position by position, and I think they have more players that I say uh, I would take as they're uh, talking just purely starters, uh, than the Rangers. But it's almost 50-50. Um, I didn't quite count it. I should have, though. I think it was about I think it was about 6-3 to three for the Astros starters to Rangers starters yeah. mm-hmm. in terms of just their starting nine. And then mm-hmm. um, pitching staff, yeah, I, I think they have a bit more solidification just because uh, they have more health there. Um yeah, I, I, I'm picking the Astros, but I'm really not too confident in it. The Rangers, once again, Jacob deGrom, always on the IL somehow, and Max Scherzer is, uh, he's kind of a ghost of his true self. Yeah. Um, not, you know, not to say he couldn't become good once again this year. I could totally see him uh, having an amazing season once again. Um, I kind of forgot that the Astros got Josh Hader too. So to think that with – a great starting rotation combined with Josh Hader, a closer, the type of closer that they've needed, um, you know, in the past couple seasons, they've been trying to do it with, with uh, what's his name? Ryan, Ryan Presley. Presley yeah. 
And, I mean, he's serviceable. Yeah. Josh Hader gives you potential uh, that they haven't been able to have in, in yeah. this run that they've been going on. So I have to go Astros here, but this division is too good for me to say that with any huge type of confidence. Uh, obviously, the World Championship Rangers, but the Mariners are right there. They are. I like their lineup too. Yeah. So it's really any of those three. Any of, the, uh, any of those three you can't go wrong with, I think, terribly. Yeah. Um, Jordan Cruz, do you have any qualms? Yeah, I think three three teams in this division are going to make the playoffs. Um, it's the definition of a top heavy yeah. division because you've got the Astros, Rangers, Mariners, and the two maybe two of the worst teams in all the league this year, the Angels and the Athletics. Yeah. <laughs> two teams with futures that I mean, the Angels are just bad because their just farm system is terrible. They gutted it by going for it at the deadline last year. The Athletics. Are they even going to be a team in a few years? I mean, they'll be a team, but who knows where they'll be playing uh, each of the next four or five seasons. It's ridiculous. Um, if you're an Oakland A's fan, I don't even know what I would do with myself in that situation. But this division is probably the most interesting, especially because you have three really, really good teams um, that I think can all win it. And the Astros, I guess the only concern I'd have about them is just age. Yeah. Right? And I think the Rangers, weirdly, it, I think – them winning it last year was almost, I don't want to say it was an accident, but I don't know that anyone inside that clubhouse expected it um, until the season started because their youth, their incredible prospects are just coming up now. Um, Evan Carter came up late in last year. He was huge for them in the playoffs. Wyatt Langford is going to come up for them. I believe he's going to, I don't know if he's going to start opening day, but I know he's on the roster. Mm. They're going to be good for a long time too. And that's the other thing I think, people need to understand is the Rangers winning it last year was simply just because they went out and spent a lot of money and combined it with a few good prospects. Now all their prospects are about to come up. And so now they're going to start, I don't want to say a dynasty, but a lot of years of being really good. So absolutely. I, I guess we'll just have to see if that young talent on the Rangers uh, is going to be able to keep them up this season. Um, My pick still is the Astros. I just think the old, old talent that they have uh, is going to be why they can still keep up in this division uh, and still make a huge run into the postseason. Um, and just to throw it out there, I think that the American League champion will be not the Astros. Let's go. The Baltimore Orioles. I think the American League champion will oh. be the Baltimore Orioles, uh, and they'll make a run at the World Series this year. And I think they'll make runs – for the next couple seasons, just because yeah. they're so young. Yeah. So that American League, I don't want to say will be owned by the Orioles, but they will have a strong grasp of it in the next coming season. Shout out um, to the, or- the only Orioles fan anybody knows, my brother. Shout out. This is with <laughs> all the years of terribleness, 100, 100 loss plus seasons, they waited and now they're really freaking good. So <laughs> I've heard Camden Yards is pretty nice, though. So It's never- nice, but quick side note, they made one of the worst – modifications to their stadium in history by moving the left field wall back. It looks really? freaking stupid. Yeah. It's just it not so in stupid. line with center and right field, I it's guess. It's not. It's not. It's like it's perfectly nice and circular, I guess. And then once you get to left field it goes back for some huh. reason because it used to be in and I think they compl- there was complaints that there was too many homers or something. <laughs> they don't like right-handed hitters. Is that a thing? I don't think too many homers is a thing. So. Wow. No, that stinks. You can punch a ball it must to have left. Been, and... It must have been some older folks that complain about that i don't know I don't too know. many home runs whoever complained about it screw you yeah <laughs> i agree um we're gonna move on to the national league um we're gonna start with the nl east and i think this is one clear answer this was one clear answer last year this was one of the picks that i got right last year and it's the atlanta braves yeah um i think it's absolutely absurd to think anything else this is one of my strongest uh picks i think one of Most people's strongest picks. The Phillies are the only team that I think could stand a chance. Yeah. Um, But, I mean, they still have all the same guys as they had last year, and they were one of the best teams in the past decade last season. Um, Their outfield is, I think, the best in baseball. Uh, Michael Harris kind of leads that, and obviously Ronald Acuna kind of leads that team especially on their lineup too um 
they have an amazing amazing pitching staff is what you need in baseball of course yep. um it's just crazy to just think that this team won a single playoff game last season yeah one just one yeah a great playoff game that was too yeah it was a terrific playoff game but just one yeah i so but good thing we're only talking about the regular season right now because I mean, you just never know what happens in the postseason anymore with baseball, but um, I think the Braves take this division handily. I just, if I was a Braves fan, I'd be really, really sad if they didn't uh, at least get to the championship series this season. Like, yeah, it, you have to win a series this season, or else it's like, did we make the right move making all these seven-year, eight-year extensions with some of these yeah, guys? Yeah, it, it's weird because – the year they won the World Series was when I think they won 86 games in the regular season. Yeah. <laughs> they barely won a terrible National League East, and then they just trounced through the National League. And yeah. they did it, and every year since then they've won 100 games and have won, I think, one game in each of the last two postseasons. But so. can't get it done in the playoffs. So nope. it's it'll be very interesting to see if they can make a run at the playoffs this yeah. year, unlike last season. But, uh, yeah, I think it's the Braves all the way unless – uh, Jordan Cruz convinces me otherwise. I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise. I do think the Philadelphia Phillies, I don't think they'll win the division, but I think they're a 94-95 win team. I, I think the Phillies are going to be really, really good this season. Um, they'll get another home playoff game probably as the four seed. Yep. Um, a guy on the Braves that I, I'm not a fan of, and everybody loves him because he's – Got a mustache, I guess, and he can throw really fast. But every single time he has a big game, Spencer Strider gives up bombs, okay, I to agree. the Phillies, oddly enough, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a huge Spencer Strider guy, but the rest of this Braves rotation, I think, is might end up being the difference in them winning a few more games because they do have Spencer Strider, who is good. I just don't think he's, like, Cy Young, a Cy Young guy unless he just wins a lot of games, which he's on the Braves. So he could have, like, a four ERA, and he'll probably still win 20 games this season. Max Freed. Love him. Charlie Morton. He's old on the older side, but I do kind of like the I do like the way he pitches. Biggest signing of the, of the offseason, in my opinion, in the entire National League, and I'm serious. More than Shohei, at least for this season, more than Yamamoto for the Dodgers, more than Cody Bellinger coming back to the Cubs. Chris Sale yeah. is on the Braves. That's a huge deal for them, I no think. No one talks about that. Huge deal. He has looked incredible this mm-hmm. spring. He's pitching with he's got new life on his fastball. He looks like he's healthy, knock on wood. And if he does stay healthy, this rotation is going to be nasty. Absolutely. To go along with that young, incredible, everybody knows who they are lineup. Yeah. So that that's that was a huge deal for me. Other than that, the division, um, they don't really have any, like, awful teams. Like, I don't even think the Nationals are that awful. No. The roster no. isn't great, but they're young and they fight. Um, the Mets are a disaster. Marlins are probably going to be the same as they are every year with great pitching, spotty offense, and they might make a playoff push. Who knows? Yeah. But They'll be in it by the last game of the season, I think. Yeah. But, uh, well, last week, I should say. But uh, I still think the Braves are going to hand away with this division. I think that's even more impressive that they can uh, really ease. I think they'll really easily win this division. Uh, and I still have a lot of confidence in the other teams in this division, too. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, National League West, there's also only one answer. Now, uh, by the way, the Braves are also my confident pick. Yeah. So that's uh, three of my four, and moving on to my fourth confident pick is the National League West, the Dodgers. And just to think, they won the division by 16 games last year. Yeah. And they got way better. Like, yeah. Mountains better mm-hmm. than last season. How many games will they win it by? Yeah, 20? 25? I, it, it's, it's crazy to think that they did that last year. And last year was like the one of the worst teams that we've seen in this Dodgers dynasty, I guess, in the past decade. Yeah. Well, I wasn't very confident in them winning yeah. it last season. I, I think I picked the Padres yeah. last year. And they kind of went downhill later on in the season, of, of course. Uh, but they just make everybody, it seems, better. Freddie Freeman, even our guy Jason Hayward, is he, he's landed a new spot 
in L.A. Um, you know, the rotation j- is probably going to get even better as the season goes because Kershaw and Walker Buehler are coming back. Um, they're they're going to start the year on I.L., but they obviously got Yamamoto and Tyler Glass now. They'll be the two-headed monster to start the season. I love this team. I lo- <laughs> Actually, no, I hate this team. I love how they're built. I love for Dodger fans that they seem to be able to spend money like it's nothing, like it just doesn't exist. Um, they even signed freaking Will Smith to like a 10-year, whatever, 150 yeah. million contract. Which is def- which they deferred, I think, 50 million of that. <laughs> there go like, the Dodgers again. It just doesn't make – like they're <laughs> going to be really bad in 15 years. <laughs> yeah, 15 years, Dodgers going to be awful. But until then – yeah, but until then, they're going to be absolutely dominant. They figured out a way to just dominate the idea of structuring a baseball team in general, um, which, I mean, I, can, I don't know. This kind of just brings up the question, like, should there be a salary cap in, in baseball, like, yeah. like, a, like how they do it in, in the NFL? Because, yeah. like, this luxury tax thing obviously doesn't matter to the Dodgers. Yeah. Like, well, I'd argue certain teams shouldn't take it as seriously as they do. But. Yeah, agreed. But anyway, anyways, the Dodgers are going to run away with this division. And if you're a Padres fan, oh my gosh, I'd be bawling my eyes. I would have been bawling my eyes out this off season just because this was the time for them to like make a run into the playoffs, make a run at at a possible postseason. But I mean, the Dodgers just always seem to get better. And now it seems like none of these teams have a chance to make a run at it too. A dark horse, I will say, are the San Francisco Giants. Yep, I was just about to say that. I like their lineup a whole lot better than what I see a lot of people online, and their rotation really isn't that bad either. So, um, oh my gosh, I was trying to think of the name, but I couldn't think of it. They, they just got a starter, I believe. Um, and Blake I Snell. Blake Snell, the Cy Young guy. One of the Boris Cy Four who ended up yep. getting a terrible contract because Scott Boris, Boris has an ego. Yeah. Blake Snell. Come on the podcast, Scott Boris. We'll debate. <laughs> Blake Snell is on the Padre, or excuse me, is on the Giants now, um, coming from the Padres, and I, I don't know if it's going to get him much more wins on the season, but I guess we'll see because I think the Dodgers are going to run away, run away with it. Now, our NL Central. I think this is the most interesting. I'm going to punch Joey. Pick. We talked about my four confident ones. We talked about my one other one that I'm not so confident in, and this is the other one I'm not so confident in. Uh, but I want to hear from Jay Cruz first before mm-hmm. I announce my pick because I, I think this is will just I, this will be certainly the most interesting division in all of baseball. I just want to give one more shout out on this podcast to my Rangers. But at 6:30 on Thursday, which has already passed by the time you're watching this. It's time for war. A business is business. Woo! No more Rangers. It's all Cubs. <laughs> and the Cubs are winning this division. And Joey Bernard, I want to smack you for the prediction that you have made. <laughs> I, I just, I, of all the teams, of all the teams, you pick, just, I'll let you do it. Just, I'm so disappointed in you. I'm picking the Cincinnati Reds to win the division, I think. And... I mean, I think I think you know it too. Every time no, we pl- I don't. every time we played the Reds last season, they were a thorn in our side. I'm pretty sure they won the season series against us, ten to eight. I, if I'm not mistaken, I, mean, I, I yeah. could be mistaken there. But they were a real thorn in our side, and I think they're going to be much better this season, given that they have another year on their belts as a young roster. Obviously, El- Ellie De La Cruz is the name that everyone talks about. Um, he's a high-flying dude that I do believe can kind of carry a team. He has the base running skills that you would want uh, out of a guy, a speedy guy that can get on base really quickly, too. Um, I think their pitching staff is a lot better than everyone gives them credit for. Uh, Hunter Green uh, and Frank, Frankie Montas is the guy. I think he's going to be starting opening day, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I like Graham, Graham Ashcraft, too. Those three are all young guys that I think are going to get a lot better, too. They're very raw, very young, but I think another year under their belts, they're going to be a lot better. 
And my explanation also includes just the fact that there's always one division winner that we don't see. It just kind of comes out of nowhere. And everyone's picking the Cubs right now. Maybe. Are they? Are, is everybody picking the Cubs? From what I've seen, everyone's picking okay, the Cubs. I thought, okay. I've seen a lot of mixed bag. I've seen, I've seen Cubs, okay. Brewers, Reds, and Cardinals. The most popular vote are the Chicago Cubs for the division winner. Um, you don't see pirates, of course, the low life pirates. Um, but the top three, from what I've seen, are it goes Cubs, Reds, and Cardinals. Um, very few pick in the Cardinals, but it's mostly just the Cubs and the Reds. Um, you know, maybe this is a thing about how I, be, because I haven't seen Craig Council on my team and how he's gonna uh, manufacture my team's lineup yet. Um, but right now, before the season starts, I'm picking the Reds. Until otherwise, I'm going to keep with the Reds. And that could be very, very soon. But I'm going to keep with my Reds pick for now. What say you, Jake? I, well, I've said a lot already. I'm thoroughly disappointed in you, JB. <laughs> and it should be known, the Cubs were 6-7 and seven versus the Reds last year. But we won five of the last seven games. Okay. And you... You know just as well as I do that the Cubs turned a corner in like late June. Late, yeah. They were a completely different team. And so from that moment on, you know, we were five and three against them. That's fair. And won five of the last And seven. that's the Cubs so, team that I view to team. be this year's team. Right. Now, I, I, not to say that I think the Chicago Cubs are going to be bad at all this year. I, I think they're going to be much improved. I think they're going to earn a wild card spot. The other thing with for sure. You, you have Frankie Montas on here, which I think is a good signing for Cincy. But ever since he's left Oakland, he has been – I mean, to say he's been a shell of himself is an understatement. He's been bad. Ever yeah. since he left Oakland, went to New York, he was terrible. Again, guys like Green and Ashcraft, like, they've been in the league long enough by now to where I, f- I feel like if we were going to see cha- – or if we were going to see greatness in them, we would have seen it on a more consistent basis. But the rest, Reds pitching staff is why they collapsed – um, yeah. towards the end of last season because it looked like for a while that they were just going to run away with the division even um, with how well they were playing, and then they just really fell off a cliff um, toward the end of the year. I also have a quick statement I want to make okay. about a couple different players in the division. We have we have two freaks in the NL Central, Ellie De La Cruz on Cincinnati Reds and a guy who didn't play much last year because he got hurt early in the season, O'Neal Cruz for the mm. Pittsburgh Pirates, and I want to make a oh statement here. O'Neill Cruz will have a better season than Ellie De La Cruz. Really? Wow. Yes. I'm a bigger well, I'm a bigger fan of O'Neill Cruz than I am Ellie De La Cruz. You know what? I'll, I I'll love be, me some O'Neill Cruz. <laughs> I'll be totally honest. They're I like kinda the same like, player. I kind of like just forgot about him because what he because he got he hurt. Got hurt. Yeah. In May. It was, I don't know when it was exactly. What, but it was very. Early it was in the, in the first half of the season. Yeah. But besides the point, I forgot about him to be He's honest. He's a, a menace. To <laughs> he is. And, he, and they, he's more – he plays more of a real – of a, a game that you can replicate more consistently than Ellie De La Cruz does because yeah. Ellie De La Cruz – I don't want to compare him to Javi Baez because he's not that bad. But, like, he's, he's he was like Javi in a way that he has so many highlights mm-hmm. that it kind of – it kind of blinds people to, to how valuable of a baseball player he actually is because most of his highlights from last season are from, like, a one-month span, really. And you don't really, you kind of forget that he actually was pretty bad. Um, yeah. Other in that one month span, I mean, he hit two thirty five last year. It's not great. El- Ellie De La Cruz hit two thirty five last 235 year. Two thirty five last year. Yeah. Like overall last year. Overall last year he hit two thirty five. Again, he's young. He, obviously, he can get better. But he really str- and he's a switch hitter. He was terrible from the right side. Like, god awful from the right That's side. Surpri- that genuinely surprises me. I would have thought it would be way better. Yeah. So I'm saying. Does that switch my pick, though? No. Well, for you, I mean, I guess that's up to you to decide, but it should. I don't know. But, but sometimes you just got to go with your gut, I guess. I'm going to stick with the Reds. Your gut against your team. It is what it is. It does. It. it, it <laughs> I think, I don't know. We've seen me from this podcast be so biased towards my Packers a lot what? in a lot of my picks. No, what are you talking about? Some of the times it was within reason. Some of the times it wasn't. And I think something just tells me about this Reds team that they're going to perform a lot better. 
uh, in this upcoming season. As much as I want to be wrong, and I mean, we haven't even talked about the Cardinals as much. Like, they still have some stars in that team, but their pitching staff got a lot worse. Uh, I mean, excuse me, pardon me. Did they sign Sonny Gray? They got Sonny Gray. Well, yeah. here's the thing. It's funny how I was just told somebody this yesterday. The Cardinals lost Adam Wainwright, mm-hmm. Yanni Molina, and Albert Pujols to retirement, right? Mm-hmm. And yet, somehow, now is when the team is looked at as old, <laughs> when, when they don't have <laughs> yeah. those guys. And they are. They signed Lance Lynn, who was in his late 30s, Sonny Gray, I believe his mid-30s, or at least, you know, 33, I think at least. Like, they just... For, and they got Brandon Crawford too. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of. They just decided to just get old all of a sudden. Like, yeah. I, why? Don't do that. You're going to be tired by like July. Get, get Goldschmidt's 36. Like, get old guys after you lose the other old guys that you had on your team. Yeah. Arenado's 32. Like they are, they are becoming yeah. a retirement home essentially. That's interesting. Their it's, opening day starter is Michaelis. And now it's, it's rough. <laughs> I. I love to see them go downhill. I love it. <laughs> I, I love it, to be honest. But um, if you're a Cardinals fan, I'm sure it's just kind of sad to see. <laughs> but my pick is still going to be the Reds. I'm trusting my gut with this one. I hope to be wrong. I really what do. What concerns you about the, Is it more of just you're so high on the Reds, or is it like you don't believe in any other team? I'm, I guess it's just more that I need to see it to believe it that the Cubs are going to win this division. Uh it's not that I don't think they can. They certainly can. If everything goes right, they should. But I guess I'm just like, I don't think everything's going to go right, I guess. Why? Um, purely because Craig Council I, – I love Craig Council. I love the signing of Craig Council. I haven't seen him play with my team yet. It's just I, – I want to know how he's going to be with my team. Okay. So well, I think we're already one step there with him actually hitting Ian Happ in the leadoff. Yeah, a guy who gets on base, That's have true. him be the leadoff guy as opposed to a guy who is a, a ground ball machine. I also just really, really like Ellie De La Cruz and a lot of the young guys on uh, jo- Jonathan India, someone else that we haven't even he's talked good. about. He's he's, good. he's a very good second baseman too. So I think those guys combined will be enough to win this division. Now, it'll be very, very close. I think the NL Central is very underrated this year. It is. In the past, they, they've, they've been giving people reason to say that it stinks. But I think this year it's a pretty underrated division. Like, if the Pirates are the worst team and they've got a solid young core, Key Brian Hayes, Brian Reynolds, they signed to a long deal, um, and then O'Ne- O'Neill Cruz, like we were mentioning, um, Henry Davis as well, one of their pretty much their top prospect, came up last season. They've got a pretty solid young core. If that's your worst team... I think you've got a pretty good division. And the Milwaukee Brewers, like... <laughs> They've still got some good players, but the fact that they did lose Council, I think, is a huge deal for the them. The Brewers got better on offense this year than they were last year, and that was their, their crutch uh, yeah. as to why they couldn't make a run in the playoffs, of course. But, yeah, I mean, they won the division by nine games, and it's taken us until now to even talk about them as in this division. So yeah. it's certainly going to be... I think it's going to be much better. It's a much better division than everyone's saying it's going to be. Um, I want my Cubbies to win it. I really do. I Something in my gut tells me that it's not going to come together this year. It'll come together next year. Now, regardless, I think they're going to make the playoffs Okay. as a wild card. Okay. But I think That's all I need from you. That's all I need. Now, and as you know, wild card teams can make a run at – the World Series as well. Absolutely. So, yeah. That is how I think the MLB division winners will be. Um, I'll put it out there. I think the Braves will be uh, in the World Series. So that means I think my World Series preseason pick will be Braves and Orioles. Not that it really matters right now because we're still seven, eight months away from the World Series. And baseball changes as the season goes on. So I was two for six last year. We'll see how it goes uh, this season, um, and yeah, I guess to be honest, I won't even we, we won't even have this podcast anymore by the time uh, next season comes around. That that's kind of sad to think about. Let's not talk about it yet. Yeah, we'll get there. It's okay. okay. I'm sorry, guys. Let's talk about what we learned. Yeah, go ahead. Let's Joey. talk about what we learned. I learned 
something very, very sad to think about. And this comes along with the terrible news, terrible news uh, from the NFL. They announced a new rule change, and it, like, makes me worried about what the league is going to come to in the next couple of seasons because they announced the banning of the hip drop tackle rule. And what this rule is, uh, is I have it written down here as they define it in the rule book, right? A hip drop, a hip drop tackle is a foul if A, a defender grabs the runner with both hands or wraps the runner with both arms and B, Unweights himself by swiveling and dropping his hips and or lowering the body, lowering the body, landing on and trapping the runner's legs at or below the knee. You know how many tackles can be defined just by that? A lot. A lot. A crap ton. Yeah. A crap ton. Black football. I cannot wait for the first week when Josh Allen throws 450 yards, six touchdowns, Five touchdowns. Well, let's be realistic here. On screen passes. <laughs> yeah, on screen passes. And uh, he gets uh, – excuse me. The, they, the Bills end up blowing a lead because one of his defenders uh, gets called on a hip drop tackle. Hip, hip drop tackle, excuse me. Uh, and they end up losing the game. And then everyone's going to freak out about it finally. I think I have – Good sign. I have seen a lot of people freaking out about this rule, and rightfully so. But it's dumb. It's yeah. a dumb rule change. This is an is an effort to stop lower body body injuries, and I like it's just gonna happen. Yeah. It's just gonna happen. Like I'm a guy who's all for protecting the head and the brain. Entirely different than your lower body. That's just a thing that happens in a contact sport with yeah. your lower body. Yeah. And that heals a lot better and differently than your brain. It's it's a lot less sensitive, and it's just a part of the game. It's time to toughen up. It's time to not have as many of these rule changes uh, just to keep offensive players healthy. And this is terrible for the game. So do you have any thoughts about the hip drop? <sighs> I'm not as, like, doomsday about it as you are, but – I do fear that there are going to be way too many games in this NFL season where the talking point the next day is not going to be about the teams, how the game ended up. It's going to be about this rule. A controversial. And that's the only – and the NFL probably doesn't care because it's more people talking about their sport, so they don't really give a crap. But as a, a fan, you want the games to be about the games. Yeah. And not about these random storylines from the NFL offices and the officials or whatever. It just takes all the fun out of things. It's, That's the way I look at it. It's dumb. It's dumb, and it's going to just bring more controversy. Cr- controversy, excuse me. And it just reminds me of the uh, pass interference thing. Um, oh, that was a disaster. How you could challenge that call, uh, you know, years ago. They luckily got rid of that finally. But yeah. um, I think if everything goes how it should, this should be just a one-year thing, and it, they'll Hopefully. get rid of it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I also think, too, this may be a thing where players at some point realize that it was never really necessary to do it. So it may just have a natural way of of weaning out hip drop tackles, but you also don't need a rule about it either, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's going to – obviously it's going to encourage you not to do it this year, but let's say they get rid of it after this season. I could see them straying away from it in the following season. And, and I also saw there's guys are going to change. See, these are NFL players. These aren't people like you and me, right? Mm-hmm. Who, they can tackle in so many different ways. They're going to figure out another way to bring guys down consistently. Like defenses in the NFL are better than they ever have been. As weird as that is to say, like it's, yeah. it's a passing league. That doesn't mean it's like a high scoring offense league though. Defenses are as good as they've ever been. They will figure out ways to get guys down. So I don't really think in terms of a, a game standpoint, it's going to change much, but the issue that the NFL has created now is these different ways to tackle guys that teams are going to come up with will be ways that are probably going to cause injuries. Like I saw one 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 guy posted somebody just diving at a dude's ankles. Like that's yeah. going to happen a lot more now. No, yeah. no, not not because they're trying to hurt him, but like that's the only way they can get him down, and there's no really rule against diving at a guy's legs instead of 
taking them down the hip drop way. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I, I just don't think that this kind of a rule actually ends up fixing the issue. It, it's just kind mm -hmm. of a... A, 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 an excuse to add another rule, I guess. Yeah. For the I, sake of adding rules. They and obviously they also we we haven't even talked about it. They changed the kickoff rules too, and I think I think that'll be better for the sport too. That'll it'll, be okay. I, I yeah. think it'll be okay. It'll be it'll make it more exciting. Yeah. I don't know if I'm necessarily of one opinion or the other. I haven't really watched how the XFL does the kickoff rule, but uh, I certainly think this hip drop rule is not good for the sport of football. I've seen a lot of people compare it to rugby and say that if rugby can do it and they have the hip drop rule, uh, then why can't the NFL? Well, it's two not, different sports. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Two I don't know sports. how that's a comparison. Um, I know we need to start wrapping it up here, but just one last thing. Uh, you know, the – oh, do you, you remember the iconic DK Metcalf runs down after a pick six yeah. and catches mm -hmm. the defender. By this rule, that would be a hip drop tackle. Yeah. That would be a flag, and I think that's yeah. insane. Now he didn't looking at that play again. I, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm support in support of this rule. He didn't have to tackle him like that, but it is kind of a natural way for a guy who's not used to tackling to tackle. Yeah. And so like it's gonna be weird. Like if a quarterback tries to take somebody down, like naturally that's just kind of the way your body tries to do it. So yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. What'd you learn this week? I learned this week, and it's kind of weird how this happened uh, so much, and I know. I remember two months ago I said I wasn't going to talk about the NFL, but all that's on my freaking timeline right now is stuff about Caleb Williams. Um, and I just wanted to, to say that – I'm just going to say this now and so that during the season when people are making jokes about it, you know my position, okay? Mm. I don't really care about Caleb Williams' lifestyle, his nails, his phone case. Have you seen the dude's girl, by the way? Is he his girlfriend? No. You – just go look, okay? Okay. This is a manly dude. I don't give a crap what he wears, and he plays well. And that's really all I care about. If he plays well for the Chicago Bears, I don't care. I don't care what kind of outfit he wears. I don't care if people think that he's a fairy or anything like that. I'm in on Caleb Williams. Yeah, see? Yeah. I'm in on Caleb. And not because I am – not a Justin guy anymore because I still am a Justin guy. I still wish he was on the Bears. Still wish he was our QB. But I would like to see him be good just to shove it in all these haters' faces. And there, and, it, and here's the thing: it's a lot of Bears fans who are doing this. And the Bears fan base has never been more toxic. And it's in a time where they should be more hopeful than ever because of the great roster that we've been building, because of all the, these high draft picks that we have. So shame on you, Bears fans. Who cares? All that matters is his play on the field. And if he does suck, okay, maybe then you can start to blame that. But don't just start saying that this guy's going to stink just because of what he wants to wear. Okay. Who cares? All that matters is the play on the field. Yeah. Right, JB? Absolutely. I agree. I like Caleb Williams. I think I think the Bears are going to be in the wild card this year. Thanks. So. I would love that. That's some hope. I would love nothing more than that. Yeah. So, this has been – episode 24 of the inside sports podcast that's with the de capitalized this is joey bernard i'm here with jordan cruz cole daly was gone this week hopefully he'll be back next week um but you should tune in next week to find out you should subscribe to us on youtube mm -hmm. like the video make sure to leave a comment follow us on spotify like us on spotify can you do anything else you can't comment on spotify no. You can leave a review. I you think. can leave a review. Leave a good review. Leave a five star review. Leave a five star review for us on Spotify after you know that my opening, or excuse me, my MLB season picks are going to be all correct. Maybe give us your MLB season yeah, picks in the maybe, comments. Yeah, give us your picks. Have a good one, and um, we'll get back to you next week.